Welcome to Hours of Service Rules for Property Carrying CMV Drivers. Hello drivers, I'm Victor. I've been on the road for the better part of 25 years, accident free. And I'm Nate. I'm well under 25 years on the road, so I'll be looking to learn today like many of you. There's going to be a lot of information we're going to go over, and I'm sure I'll be able to pick up a few new tricks too. So Nate, any accidents in your time? Thankfully, my other training has kept me from bending a bumper, uh, or worse. Nice. So listen up, folks. By the end of this program, you'll see the purpose of the hours of service regulations and the impact they have on your day-to-day -day operations. You'll be able to explain and apply hours of service regulations, including on-duty limits, driving limits, and the 34-hour restart provision. In addition, we're going to help you become competent tracking your hours of service using an automatic onboard recording device, or AOBRD, an electronic logging device, or ELD, and let's not forget good old paper logs. <laughs> I'll show you old. Look, we all agree that safety is key, right? The purpose of the hours of service regulations and this video are obvious. We're trying to keep everyone on the road safe and compliant. No joke, chances are you or someone you know has suffered some fatigue when behind the wheel. Fatigue can lead to bad decisions and potentially serious, if not deadly, crashes. The federal regulations governing interstate commerce cover two areas. The first is hours of service. As you may expect, these are the number of hours drivers are allowed to drive or work in a defined time frame, and these hours must be accounted for. The second is the driver's daily log. Some of us veteran drivers might still call them grid logs, but I'm sure you already knew that, didn't you? That sounds familiar. The regulations that are designed to protect drivers come from both federal and state agencies. The Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations are issued by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, or FMCSA. Keep in mind, many states also have hours of service requirements that go above and beyond the feds. It can be confusing from time to time because the federal regulations may or may not match the intrastate requirements. And it's up to drivers and motor carriers to keep current on all the regulations that apply to you, including hours of service for your specific operation. So, tell us, Nate, Who's regulated? Federal regulations for hours of service apply if your vehicle weighs or combination of vehicles is rated at 10,001 pounds or more. You also will be under hours of service regulations if you transport hazardous materials in quantities large enough to require placards. Remember, the hazardous material regulation is in effect no matter what the vehicle you're driving weighs. If you're placarded, you're under HOS regulations. True. And like you mentioned earlier, the responsibility for compliance is on you, whether you're a driver or a motor carrier. Meeting the various on-duty, driving, and off-duty requirements of the hours of service rules and keeping an accurate, up-to-date log can be a challenge. The hours of service regulations are among the most often violated, comprising about one-third of all roadside violations. Right. Along with traffic accidents caused by driver fatigue, non-compliance with the hours of service regulations can result in fines, being put out of service, and poor CSA scores. The most commonly issued driver violations in the FMCSA's Compliance Safety Accountability, or a CSA program, are related to hours of service. It's safe to say if you don't understand the rules, you're looking at a violation eventually. If your carrier is audited, it will show the FMCSA enforcement officer a pattern of violations in the CSA HOS basic. And no one likes extra attention during audits. You got that right. As you're probably all well aware, the Behavior Analysis and Safety Improvement Categories, or BASICs, are the seven buckets into which carrier and driver violations are placed in the safety measurement system under the CSA program. For carriers, it's no surprise the more hours of service violations you have, the higher your hours of service compliance basic score will be. The mindset of accepting violations as a part of doing business or driving is definitely not the way to go. That way of thinking is likely to produce more violations and cost you in productivity and profitability. That's true. Like so many things, if you're letting one thing slip, chances are you're letting a lot of things slip. Let's be honest. The consequences for violations can compound quickly and they can make you look like a bad carrier and a bad driver. They can translate into big fines quickly too. Examples of violations under the Hours of Service Compliance Basic include driving beyond the eight hour limit since your last break, operating your vehicle when ill or fatigued, or driving after being declared out of service. Other examples 
are operating over hours, keeping a false log always a no-no, and having a log that's not current. Similarly, not maintaining a log when one is required to be used, and finally, failure to hold on to the previous seven days logs. With so many ways to violate the regulations, proper tracking of duty time is essential to making sure you're not putting yourself or your employer at risk. You're probably thinking that being on duty and being off duty is fairly easy to keep separate. The regulations are very specific and clear about where the line is drawn. Like we said before, we're trying to keep everyone on the road safe and compliant. So the regulations allow for only so much time for drivers to drive. Too much time on duty can result in fatigue, and that's why drivers and motor carriers must track all of their on-duty time. The regs define on-duty time as all time from the time a driver begins work or is required to be in readiness to work until the time the driver is relieved from work and all responsibility for performing work. The definition of on-duty time includes waiting to be dispatched, inspecting, servicing, or conditioning a commercial motor vehicle. Driving, which is further defined as time spent at the controls of a CMV in operation. Being in or on a CMV other than time spent resting in or on a parked vehicle. Except Vic, when attending to a commercial vehicle containing a Division 1.1, 1.2, or 1.3 explosive material. That's right, Nate. On-duty time is also being in or on a CMV other than time spent resting in the sleeper berth. Or being in or on a CMV other than up to two hours riding in the passenger seat of a CMV moving on a highway immediately before or after a sleeper berth period of at least eight consecutive hours. On-duty time also includes loading or unloading your commercial motor vehicle, repairing, obtaining assistance, or attending to a disabled CMV, complying with drug or alcohol testing requirements, and finally, performing any other work for your carrier or any compensated work for another employer. On the other hand, off-duty time is just that. It's time when you're not on duty. It includes time when you're relieved of all duties or responsibility for performing work. Off-duty time also includes time when you're able to choose your activities and free to leave the place where your CMV is parked. In certain situations, off-duty time is when you're resting in the seat of your vehicle. For this time to be counted as off-duty, you must not be doing any work-related activities whatsoever. Now here's a pro tip. Compensation or salary for a specific period of time does not dictate how time should be long. Getting paid does not automatically mean on duty, and no pay does not automatically mean off duty. Wow, that's a veteran pro tip. Well done. And remember, all compensated time for a non-carrier counts. So that part-time weekend job must be logged as on duty. That's an easy point to forget, but that's not all when it comes to on duty time, is it? No, we also need to talk about travel time. Drivers traveling to another location as a passenger should record their time as on duty. For example, if you took a two-hour bus ride to pick up a CMV for your motor carrier, you would record the two hours of travel time as on duty. However, if you took at least 10 consecutive hours off duty after you arrived at your destination, you would record the entire time, all 12 hours, as off duty. Now that we have a good understanding of who is regulated and what is defined as on duty and off duty time, Let's move on and talk about the limits. The hours of service regs involve four maximum limits, the 14 hour on duty limit, the 11 hour driving limit, the 60 or 70 hour on duty limit, and the mandatory brake provision or eight hour driving limit. Let's take a closer look. To start with, you can drive or begin your shift only if you've been off duty for 10 consecutive hours. So let's say your company has you on duty at 6 a.m. That means you have to be off duty since 8 p.m. the night before. Got it? Yep. Now, let's move on to our first regulation limit, the 14 hour on duty limit. Now, this limit means you can drive only during a period of 14 consecutive hours after coming on duty. If your company has you on duty at 6 a.m., your 14 consecutive hours ends at 8 p.m. Once you finish this 14 hour duty window, you can drive again only after you've been off duty for 10 consecutive hours or at 6 a.m. the following day. And another thing to remember, Nate, is that the 14-hour period is consecutive and all-inclusive. In other words, it includes all on-duty and off-duty time you've accumulated since starting your shift. Right, so for example, stopping for lunch or taking a break doesn't extend the 14-hour limit. 
And the same goes for unforeseen events, such as a breakdown or having to wait for an extended period to load or unload your truck. Victor, you probably know some drivers have mistaken the 14-hour limit to mean their shift must end after 14 hours, but that's not the case. The hours of service rules only limit you from driving past 14 hours, not working past 14 hours. Yep. So in other words, you can do non-driving work past the 14-hour limit. You just can't drive until you've completed a 10-hour off-duty period and gotten adequate rest. Since I'm on a roll, Nate, I'll move on to the 11-hour driving limit. Be my guest. So of the 14 consecutive hours we just discussed, you can spend 11 of those hours driving. And remember, all time you spend at the controls of your CMV is considered driving time. This includes the time you spend sitting in traffic on a public road. Then, after 11 hours of driving time, you must go off duty for at least 10 consecutive hours before you can drive again. And this rule does not limit a driver to 11 hours per day. You can drive more than 11 hours in one calendar day as long as you have 10 hours off after the first 11 hours of driving. Good stuff, Nate. Now let's talk about the third mandatory limit, the 60 or 70 hour on duty limit. Sounds good. This one is a bit more complicated. So maybe we can start by distinguishing between 60 hours and 70 hours. The 60 hour limit says you must stop driving your vehicle after you've accumulated 60 hours of on duty time in a seven day period. The seven days don't necessarily tie to specific weekdays, just seven consecutive work days. This rule applies if you work for a carrier that doesn't operate CMVs every day of the week. With the 70-hour limit, you must stop driving after you've accumulated 70 hours of on-duty time in an eight-day period. This limit applies if you drive for a carrier that operates at least one CMV every day of the week at any of their locations. And it's important to know all driving time and all on-duty time is counted toward your 60 or 70-hour limit. You can still work beyond your limit and not risk a violation, you just can't add more driving time. You must include those non-driving hours in your seven or eight day total. Got it, Nate. Here's something else to consider. Since we're talking about a seven or eight day time period, think about what constitutes a day. For this rule, a day is a 24 hour period, but your carrier can decide when that day begins. It's usually at midnight. Good point. Just remember, the important thing is whatever starting time of day your carrier selects must match the starting time of day in your daily log. If that wasn't enough to think about, the 60 or 70 hour period refers to your previous seven or eight days, not to a specific work week. So you really don't ever start over counting your total hours unless you decide to use the 34 hour restart option. But we'll talk about that later. Uh, here's another pro tip. Don't forget, writing off your recap or hours you're picking up at midnight is also an option. It's kind of a lost art. Many drivers don't realize a restart isn't mandatory. It's an option, just like running off your recap hours is an option. A lost art to be sure, and I know drivers that won't take advantage. And rest assured, your ELD will make this all infinitely easier to track too. Now let's take a look at the fourth limit, the mandatory brake provision. According to the regulations, you can't drive if you haven't taken at least a 30 minute break in the last eight hours. Essentially, this eight hour clock works the same as the 14 hour clock. It includes all back to back time. Once you complete eight hours on the clock without a 30 minute break, you must take 30 minutes off before doing any driving. For example, taking a lunch break or spending time resting in your sleeper berth or in or on a parked vehicle, not doing any on duty activities, will satisfy the break requirement in most cases. It's important you factor this break into your trip plan because if you take the break too early in your first eight hours on duty, you may have to take a second 30 minute break before your 14 hours is up. One more thing on breaks, there's no limit to the number of breaks a driver can take during the day. Just know that all breaks of less than 10 hours will count against your 14 hour limit, unless you're splitting your sleeper berth time. Now that we've walked through the four maximum limits, let's move on to situations where drivers are ill or fatigued. Sure, we've all experienced illness or fatigue at one time or another. Don't try and tough it out. You know when you're too sick or too tired to drive. It's part of being professional and staying safe. So in addition to the driving limits, there's a regulation that prohibits you from driving or your motor carrier from allowing you to drive 
when you're so ill or fatigued that it's unsafe for you to get behind the wheel. All true, Nate. The bottom line is if you're feeling sick or really tired, tell your carrier and don't drive until you've had time to rest and recover. There are no awards for being the sickest or most tired driver on the road. Although we've gone through the regs on maximum limits and driving when you're ill or fatigued, there's another important provision to discuss. That's right, Victor. There's the 34-hour restart provision. Now, this rule relates back to the 60 or 70-hour limit, which essentially says once you reach your limit, you must take time off before getting back behind the wheel. So if you travel from state to state, you have an option that allows you to reset your accumulated on-duty time. Basically, once you have a break of at least 34 back-to-back -back hours, the on-duty time you accumulated in the previous seven or eight days before your break is reset back to zero. This is the 34-hour restart provision. And you can use this restart option no matter how many hours you've accumulated against your 60 or 70 hour limit. So even if you've gone over your limit doing non-driving work, you can still reset your hours by using the restart option without needing extra time off. What this all boils down to is knowing what the limits are and staying within them. The best way to ensure you do not go over the hours of service limits is with proper trip planning. Oh, and here's a quick pro tip. Legal doesn't always mean safe. Just because you can drive or you are within your legal limits doesn't mean you should, especially if you have extraordinary circumstances like when you're ill or have been through extremely stressful driving due to road conditions. That's a good point. There's no good reason not to stay safe out there. Here's something else you need to take into account when doing your trip planning to ensure you don't go over your hours, and that's parking shortages. Studies on parking shortages show that many drivers are giving themselves up to an hour to find parking. This means they are shutting down earlier to make sure they don't run up against their driving or on-duty limits. That's right, and they're sometimes going three or more hours past their limits. And you know what that means. Sure do. It means some serious violations and some pretty hefty penalties. In fact, going three or more hours past the driving or on-duty limits can get you fined over $3,600 and your carrier over $14,000 for each violation. And that really hits home for me, as I'm sure it does for you too. Yep, you never want to find yourself in that situation. That's why taking the time to properly plan your trip is so important. And that's a great lead into tracking your hours of service. To make sure you comply with the hours of service limits, you have to keep track of your hours of service. You do this with your daily log, which is also how law enforcement officers and the FMCSA know you're complying. There's a lot of good information to cover, so let's start right in with the ELD mandate. This was some big news. You might remember back in 2015, the FMCSA published the electronic logging device and supporting documents final rule, but you probably know it as the ELD mandate. Basically, it required almost all drivers using paper logs or an AOBRD to switch over to an ELD by December 18, 2017. So Nate, what are the benefits of using an ELD? Well, an ELD gets information from your vehicle's engine to automatically record your driving time. The good thing about this is it improves your ability to maintain compliance with the hours of service rules and makes it easier for you to keep your records. That does sound a lot easier, but there's gotta be a catch. Well, Vic, you'll still need to keep at least eight days of paper logs in your vehicle just in case the ELD malfunctions. If it does, you'll need to redo your current day's log as well as any logs from the previous seven days as soon as you can. That is true. If your ELD fails, you'll need to let your carrier know within 24 hours. You're required to maintain a paper log until it can be fixed or replaced, which needs to happen within eight days of the malfunction. The same goes for if you're an owner operator. Uh, let's take a step back and explain a little bit more about logging. Logging apps on mobile devices that are not synchronized with the engine cannot be considered an ELD or an AOBRD. That's also true. They're just an electronic means of creating and printing a grid log. And again, the key is if they're not synchronized with your engine, they are not an ELD or an AOBRD. An ELD is an electronic device that is able to record your driving hours and duty status automatically. And in order to be considered an ELD, it must meet the FMCSA's specific requirements and be registered on their website. 
Now that we have a clear definition of AOBRDs and ELDs, let's talk about how to use them, including some do's and don'ts. I'll take this one on Nate. Carriers are prevented by the regs from using your hours of service data to harass or force you to drive when you're ill, fatigued, or out of hours. Similarly, they're also prevented from forcing you to drive when your vehicle is unsafe to operate. So what do the regs define as harassment? Generally speaking, the regs say harassment is an action by a motor carrier toward a driver employed by them involving the use of available ELD information or other technology the carrier knew or should have known would result in a driver violation. So how do the regs define coercion? It's generally defined as withholding business, employment, or work opportunities from a driver in order to influence the driver to operate their vehicle under conditions which the driver stated would require them to violate one or more of the hours of service regulations. So let's say your dispatcher or supervisor asked you to do another run. Look, Nate, I need you to take this run to Galveston yet today. I'd love to, Chief, but I've only got two hours left. Hey, you've got to do this run anyway. Put the hammer down, this isn't a discussion. And that's harassment, knowingly forcing you to violate the regulations. Equally bad is coercion. Let's go back to that conversation. Hey, I get that you're risking your time window here, but you got to do this run. Uh, you and I both know, I really can't. It'll put me over hours. Look, you're not making this run today means you're not going to be making any more runs at this carrier ever again, get it? That's coercion that a clear threat to the driver exists, whether merely implied or stated outright. Clearly the supervisor character I was playing there was a bad guy who didn't care about the driver and keeping the roadway safe. A pro tip, if you run into a supervisor like that, remember you've got 90 days to begin the FMCSA's coercion complaint process, should you want to. Let's get back to tracking hours of service and talk about what things drivers need to do to stay compliant and running as efficiently as possible. For one thing, you need to complete your record of duty status or daily log for each 24-hour period. This log is how you keep track of your time and make sure you comply with the hours of service regs. If an officer asks, you need to be able to show a log for the current day and previous seven days if you're on the 70-hour limit, and it must be current up to your last change of duty status. And when you're using an ELD, keep the user manual handy in case you need to refer to it for things like quickly accessing its many features, understanding any codes it may display, and possibly what to do if it malfunctions. In addition, carry an instruction sheet on how to store and retrieve data from the device for use by enforcement officials. Remember, at a moment's notice, an enforcement officer could make this request. Your ELD must be able to transfer your hours of service records for the current day and the last seven days. That transfer must be done using a web address and an email account or through USB and Bluetooth connections. If you're using a paper log, your entries must be easy to read and in your own handwriting. Agreed, but whatever method you use, you need to include the following information. You should have a vertical or horizontal graph with the remark section, your 24-hour period start time that your carrier selects for your terminal, and the date and total miles you're driving today. You also need your truck or tractor and trailer number, the name of your carrier and main office address, as well as a place for your signature or certification. Finally, you'll need the name of your co-driver if you have one, the total hours in each duty status, and the shipping document numbers or the shipper and product name. The important thing to remember is a current log keeps you aware of your hours of service at all times and lets you know your available driving time for your next shift. And one last thing to keep in mind when you're driving as a team, you each have to complete your own daily log. So now that we've gone over how to keep a record of our duty status, let's talk about retention. When retaining your records, there are a number of things you're required to do. First of all, you always need to have your current day and the previous seven days record of duty status or daily log with you and ready for inspection when you're on duty. As a driver, you have 13 days after finishing a 24-hour shift to either submit or mail in your original record of duty status to your carrier. Make sure all your log entries are correct before you submit them though. When you submit your record of duty status, you're certifying your entries are true and accurate. Your carrier will then retain them for six months. 
And keep in mind, your carrier's policy may require you to turn in or submit your logs and any other trip-related paperwork sooner than required by the regs. So be sure to follow your carrier's policy. This program has given you a good idea of how the hours of service regulations will impact your day-to-day -day operations. It goes back to what we said in the beginning. Making sure tired drivers are off the road keeps everyone safe. We can all agree safety and compliance are the keys to staying violation free. No one wants a citation, fine, or out of service order. And we especially don't want any of you involved in crashes or even worse, someone losing their life. It's just not worth it to take chances. The best thing you can do is to know the hours of service rules and how to work within them. Stay in compliance and most importantly, stay safe out there.